All right, everyone. This class is about fleet doctrines and why they matter. Uh, my name is Affliction Star. I'll be the lecturer for today with some guest lecturing by Saber A, if he wants. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'll be mostly going off of a slideshow that I put together for this. Uh, there is no syllabus for it on the uni wiki, because uh, I made the class myself, and I've been too lazy to put up an article on the wiki. So if you're in the lecture.uni in-game channel, I'll link the slideshow there, and you can follow along. I'll also link it here in Mumble. All right. Like I said, my name is Affliction Star. I'm a former member of EUni, and I'm now a member of Snigwafa. And I'm here to talk to you about why doctrines are important. And I'll start off by saying that in a typical noobs on patrol type fleet, kitchen sink fleet, uh, you have brand new players who are very limited in what they can field. They typically cannot fly a lot of the bigger ships. They can fly frigates. Maybe they can fly destroyers. And that's not a bad thing by itself. Uh, the problem comes when you have someone who can only fly Galente destroyers, someone who can only fly Amar frigates, someone who can only fly Minmatar frigates. And it becomes a very kitchen sink type fleet where there's no real cohesion or cooperation between the ships. And note here that I'm not talking about the pilots not working together, I'm talking about the ships themselves not fitting together very well. So if you take a kitchen sink fleet, which is just whatever you decided to undock in, and you combine that with brand new players who don't really know how to PvP quite yet, you get uh, a not very effective or efficient fleet. So a doctrine, a fleet doctrine, is a group of ships designed around the same core idea. The fleet is designed to engage in a very specific manner, and each ship in the fleet contributes to that MO in a very specific way. With a doctrine fleet, you literally do not undock unless you know what you are getting into. If you undock in a doctrine fleet, and it turns out that the other fleet that you're going to fight is the exact counter to yours, then you did something wrong. You should know exactly what you're getting into uh, and pick the doctrine that exactly fits the situation you're going into. So, we have doctrines. Why, why bother with them? Why not just have everyone fly their own ship? And the simple answer is you are much more efficient and much more effective. In a kitchen sink... It's like you and your friends playing soccer on the same team at the gym. You go, you, yeah, you all know how to play soccer, uh, but you're nowhere near uh, the effectiveness that you could be. And I realize now that this slide says uh, a fleet doctrine is like the Spanish soccer team, but I don't know if that applies anymore. We might need to say the, the Dutch soccer team. Yeah, the Spanish got owned by Chile. Yeah. <laughs> At the time of the writing of this, the Spanish soccer team was the reigning champion of the World Cup. I, I think yeah, they're already yeah. out. Yep, they're already pretty much out. Netherlands kicked them uh, 5-1. <laughs> yeah, so either way, professional soccer team. Uh, doctrine is like a professional soccer team. Even though yeah, you and your friends know how to play soccer. You didn't spend hours and hours and hours and hours practicing it together. So you're nowhere near as effective as you could be. With doctrines, you can achieve a lot more with fewer pilots. And some doctrines can be almost untouchable unless you have the exact counter. And we'll go over the specifics of that later in this lecture. Do I have any questions so far? You can ask in Mumble 
or in lecture.uni. Why is Miss Vicky's sea salt and vinegar just the shit? Do we have any other questions? <laughs> I don't have an answer to that. So good. All right, moving on. Slide number five. The basic components of a fleet doctrine are the core DPS ships. These are the ones that actually do all of the legwork of destroying the other fleet. You have the support ships, and support includes logistics, e-war, and anti-tackle. We'll go over these rules in detail. And last but not least, probably most important, you have tackle, which consists of Tech 1 frigates and interceptors, interdictors and nullsec, and potentially recons, electronic attack frigates, and heavy interdictors in more advanced fleets. So the core DPS ships are the backbone of your fleet. The entire doctrine is built around this ship, and it determines the type of fleet you're going to be. Uh, if you're a brawling fleet, such as... Uh, I think I put all rats in this. Let me check. Yeah, you're right. Oh, the slideshow still has the cats on it. Well, Brawling Fleet is an up-close, in-your-face doctrine, so it'll focus around things with brick tanks that take a long time to DPS down. And they may not have as much DPS as other fleets, but they will survive a lot longer. You have your kiting fleets. Um, so if you have a, like a nano fleet where you're taking out shield cruisers with uh, nanofiber internal structures and you're just staying out of range of everything else. You have your projection fleets. Uh, projections means damage projection. You can shoot things a lot farther than other fleets. Uh, these will be things like your treble cat fleets or your um, tech three battle cruiser or tier three battle cruiser fleets, alpha fleets. But then you also have uh, the difference between a fleet that focuses on alpha damage, uh, volleying something off the field before the opposing logi has a chance to respond, versus a sustained DPS fleet where you just power through the opposing logi and they just can't hold reps against you. Either way, whatever you pick for your core DPS ship, that's going to determine what kind of fleet you are. So if you pick Maulers, you're going to be a brawling fleet. If you pick Caracals, you're most likely going to be a projection fleet. If you pick Tornadoes, you're going to be a projection fleet. The ships in the core DPS uh, component will only focus on dealing damage. That is their only role. And usually the fleet commander will fly this type of ship so that he knows exactly uh, what range everyone can engage and, um, and how far all the targets are, etc. Can someone please instruct Valandil, Saragon, and Lecture.euni how to get on public mumble, please? Thank you. The next component is the logistics component. Logistics ships will repair damage done to the rest of the fleet, equivalent of healers in other games. Logi are responsible for keeping the fleet alive, and they can and frequently do make or break your fleet. If you don't have enough Logi, you're probably not going to survive. There are exceptions to this. Um, fleets don't necessarily have to have Logi. A good example is the Sniping Cormorant Fleet, which is entirely made up of Cormorants and uh, Tackle. The cormorants have a light enough tank that if something breathes on them, they're going to die. So you don't 
we usually have Lodgy for that kind of fleet. Lodgy will usually have their own anchor and their own commander because range is their primary defense against the rest of uh, the enemy fleet. And the Lodgy commander will focus uh, who the Lodgy are repairing. Typically, Lodgy will be in their own sub-channel on Mumble. You'll frequently see those. Uh, they're already in the fleet section of the EUNI Mumble. And most other, um, most other alliances will have subsections of channels on Mumble for Logi specifically. Next up, we have Ewar, Electronic Warfare. And there are many different kinds of Ewar. And it all depends on what you want to do with your Ewar. For example, you have sensor dampeners that will reduce the enemy lock range or lock speed. Those are usually used on enemy logi. Use lock range to force them in, tackle them, and then uh, switch to lock speed so that they have a hard time switching targets. You have your tracking disruptors that you'll use on enemy turret DPS ships. Uh, use that to prevent the enemy from tracking or projecting to your own fleet. You have ECM to jam enemies and prevent them from locking. You have capacitor warfare with uh, either newts or nosses. Prevent them from activating any modules. And that can be guns for uh, lasers and hybrid turrets. It can be active hardeners to turn off their tank. And it can be remote rep. You can prevent them from, uh, pre prevent the enemy logi from being able to rep. Support, the EWAR support, uh, usually shares an anchor with the logistics, uh, portion of the fleet. Because again, range is their best defense. And in some cases, you may use electronic attack frigates and recon cruisers. Because they do have bonuses to EWAR. Any questions so far? Don't forget the ECM Tengu. Ah, uh, yes, the ECM Gu. That would fall under uh, Ewar. Um, next up, we have Anti Tackle. These are purely frigate killers. And they just make sure that the enemy frigates cannot tackle your fleet. When I say frigate, I mean frigate-sized, so frigate and destroyer. In the case of interdictors. These are DPS ships, but they will not be following DPS primaries that the rest of the core DPS ships follow. Because their entire role is to make sure that frigates don't get close to the fleet. good example of anti-tackle would be uh, for cheap fleets, uh, a rapid light missile Caracal. If you've got more expensive fleets, rapid light missile Cerberus or the new Orthrus is, would be a good frigate killer. But it doesn't have to be missiles. It can be small guns as well. Vexer. Yeah, Vexer with uh, light drones. Bellicose uh, can uh, fill two roles as anti tackle and e war. So these roles aren't exclusive to, or a ship is not exclusive to one role. Next we have uh, tackle. We have Tech 1 frigates and interceptors. These are ships that have very high top speeds and they're designed to close the gap between the fleets and land a point on enemy ships to prevent, prevent them from fleeing. Interceptors would be the best at this role because they have higher top speed and they have a bonus uh, per level of interceptor skill to um, micro warp drive signature radius penalty. And if you're flying a fleet interceptor like you should, uh, you'll have a bonus to point range as well. Unfortunately, 
Tech 1 frigates and interceptors are very fragile, and they're easily removed by opposing anti-tackle. So you have to be very proficient at flying your ship yourself and being able to keep up transversal against uh, turret ships and hopefully outrun enemy missiles if you are facing rapid light missile launchers. Next kind of tackle you'll have is a NullSec exclusive interdictors. They will launch interdiction bubbles, uh, which are only usable in NullSec. And these are, if you've never been to NullSec, these are uh, literally bubbles where if you're inside of it, you cannot warp. If you're taking a fleet exclusively into NullSec, you may want to replace fast tackle for the majority of enemy ships with interdictors but you'll still need some fast tackle, uh, just in case there are people that don't get caught in the bubble. Interdictors can also be used defensively to make sure that en enemy ships land exactly where you want them to land, which is usually right inside your optimal range. It's heavily used for bombers. Yes. Bombers, you want to keep the fleet there, uh, and then warp the bombers in, launch the bombs, and get out. Oh, I meant defense. It's a way of sucking yeah. the bombers to an area where they can't get at your fleet. That's a very good point. If you're just joining us, I'll relink the uh, the slideshow. Yeah, so defensive bubbles are a very big use of uh, interdiction bubbles. They're as much to keep the enemy fleet on grid as they are to make sure that enemy fleet doesn't land on you. Last but not least, or no, actually not last, uh, we have recons and electronic attack frigates. You'll focus on... Uh, Golente and Minmatar for uh, these ships. The Golente recons and electronic attack frigates have a very, very long point range. Um, I believe the Lachesis can reach an 80 kilometer point when you use a faction point and you have links. So you use the Lachesis to hold a very shiny target in place from a long way away. And then Minmatar have a big bonus to web range, used to slow things down, make sure that they cannot out-track your guns or outrun your missiles. Now, last but not least, slide 14, we have heavy interdictors. These are used for their infinite point or their uh, self-generated warp disruption bubble. Uh, the warp disruption field generator with a script is called an infinite point because no number of warp core, sta warp core stabilizers will let you escape it. If you are pointed by a heavy interdictor, you are not getting out unless you get out of range or you kill the heavy interdictor. Or jump or dock, or, but those you can do anyway. Heavy interdictors are also the only way to catch super capital ships in low sec. Super capital ships are immune to all forms of electronic warfare. Except this infinite point. And yes, Zelenoklu brings up a good point. It goes for Sino jumping as well. If something is pointed, and they don't have, uh, in the case of normal points, if they don't have enough warp core, stabilized, warp core stabilizers to overcome that, then they cannot warp they cannot use their um, jump drive. They cannot jump out. Infinite point. Uh, like I said, if you're pointed by it, you cannot um, you cannot get away unless you remove the point. Yeah, you'll um, 
I just want to add one thing. Um, you'll generally find these in low sec. Um, it's where the heavy interdictors basically shine. It's the only security where they actually are useful. Um, you don't see many heavy interdictors out in zero zero uh, because the more maneuverable interdictors, the smaller ones, are way more useful in a more variety of situations, whereas the heavy interdictor is only useful really to pointing supers in sec. Yeah, the interdictor. Go ahead. They're used primarily, also primarily in wormhole space. They also make good backup signos because of the big tank. Maybe she's carriers. <laughs> yeah, another big point about using interdictors versus heavy interdictors is that interdictors are much, much cheaper than heavy interdictors. And since interdictors are basically treated as expensable tackle, uh, go with the cheaper one. Any question about the roles? You probably want to touch on the fact that Hictors can't get reps where Dictors can. I keep forgetting about that. While a heavy interdictor has its warp disruption field generator active, it cannot receive any remote assistance whatsoever. So all it has is its own local tank. It's also slowed considerably. Yeah, it also basically can't move. They also get a lot lighter when you do that, which makes them exceptionally helpful for rolling wormholes. Yeah, those are other details of the hick. Uh, Slate Ambermont asks, how does it stay alive in that case? And the answer is, it fits a very, very stiff tank. Its goal is to stay alive long enough for uh, the the infinite point cycle to end, and for someone else to get the infinite point on the target so they can receive reps. Yeah, usually you'll find these things um, working together. It wouldn't be just one Hector, and if it is, then you're really gimping the fleet. Um, what you'll usually use these for is you'll stick them in a carrier, um, which you call a Ghost Rider. It's the doctrine. Um, when a covert, you know, a covert ops or anything like that has a Sino, uh, finds a super being stupid in low sec, lights the Sino, the Ghost Rider. Rider carrier jumps to the Sino, to the Hector out of its hold, boards the Hector from its carrier, and points the super. Now, usually you're not the only one doing this. So, port coming in, you also have slow cat carriers coming in that don't have Hectors that can offer up rep. And what the Hectors do is they cycle their points. So, if I have a, my point on the super, and, and the super's primarying me, and I'm getting hurt, I cycle my point down, I tell the next guy to put his point on, he does, my point drops, once my point is off, I can, then can receive reps from the, the carriers. So you do this simultaneously, um, in a coordinated depictors, and that's how they survive. And just to answer a question that was just asked in lecture.uni, so leaving your ship in the middle of space has practical uses. Yes, it has a very specific practical use. Yeah, the Ghost Rider um, is not... It's not an amateur maneuver. Um, you have to... You have to be supported, basically. And sometimes even... Even the best, they'll lose their ships. You know, if you get potted in your Hector, <laughs> well, your carrier's sitting there. For anybody to take. Yeah. Kind of off-topic, but also uh, part of the 
tactic is of the Ghost Rider. As soon as the pilot boards the Hick and starts to lock the uh, enemy super, they'll lock their own carrier to prevent anyone else from jumping into it. Yeah. All right. So this last portion of the class will be covering several different doctrines, so you can see how the ships in those doctrines will fill the roles that I've put forward. And we'll start with Saber's favorite doctrine, Foxcat. Ah, uh, yeah. Foxcat's core DPS ship is a pulse laser Navy Apocalypse. Uh, it basically has projection to deal with things at long range and the flexibility to uh, switch out to shorter range ammo and be able to deal with a lot of things in short range as well. Uh, it has a special ship that fills a special role called the Firewall. And this is a smart bombing Loki or Proteus or Mauler used to deal with missiles that get close to um, get close to the main fleet. And also drones, I guess, maybe? Uh, they usually sit out in front. Yeah, so mainly to deal with missiles. Logistics for this will be the Tech 2 armor logi, Guardians and Oneros, or alternatively, triage Archons usually. You don't really see that many triage Thannies. Anti-tackle is a beam laser zealot. Tackle would be uh, assault frigates or heavily tanked Tech 1 frigates. And E-War, I think it has the ECM goo, and Scorpion. And to answer Ankalana's question, you can smart bomb missiles or bombs? Yes, you can. If you look at the missile, it has a hit point amount. And Shauna says... Uh, I feel like smart bombing bombs wouldn't have much positives to it. If the bomb is destroyed by external damage, it does no damage. This is why bombing wings are limited to seven bombs, because any more than that, and the bombs will destroy each other. Yep. And yes, the seven of the same type of bomb. Any questions about fox cats? Does the union have a program to buy them for us? No. no. Well, <laughs> short no. answer is um, no. The, the reason provides the um, one. The reason why, um, as um, Affliction has said, it's one of my favorite doctrines. Um, it's one of my favorite doctrines for the simple fact that. This is a unique doctrine. Um, it has the capabilities of dealing with many doctrines at once that are that you're fighting. It can deal with your alpha maelstroms at long range. It can deal with your kiting tangus. It can deal with your your brawlers, your armor hacks, T three fleets. It can deal with all of these simultaneously. Like it's it's unbelievable. When these things are in action and everything set up and no mistakes are made, what this fleet can actually fight. Fox scans are something that the Uni would ever deploy. It's much more of a major null sick alliance thing. Yeah, I mean, I have the uh, a dumbed down version. I think it's just a regular APOC on uh, fleet up. But I don't, th I don't foresee a situation where we would actually have to use them in the uni. And Saber, that's a good question. Do you need Tech Two guns for the Fox Cat? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, the reason why it's so powerful is because of Scorch. Um, that fit, Scorch can reach out to 80k, and that's close range weapons.
And yes, Sean, so this is, is a very... It's definitely a must. It's a very expensive fleet. That's why it's uh, used out in the NullSec alliances that have a lot of money to spend on it. Uh, that's also why triage carriers, triage archons, are dropped to rep them. Yeah, it, it's basically a doctrine that you use when shit hits the fan. Yeah. And the the link to at least the fox cat itself uh, is in lecture.uni. <gasps> T1 rigs. Uh, so I got a question. Um, with tackle on the fox cat doctrine, um, um, there's no need for long range like Arazu or uh, Lachesis? Uh, usually, if you're going to do long range, it'll be a Proteus. Oh, okay. Again, Golente with their point range bonuses. Yep. Uh, and the Proteus is a tank. Like, it's just a brick. So, I mean, you're having your Galante, you know, point range bonuses with a brick tank. So it fits perfectly with fleet. Shauna also asks, how did the name come about? Uh, we'll cover that a bit later. Um, most fleet doctrines that you hear about that end in cats... Those are PL doctrines, and I have quite a bit of them here on this uh, on this uh, slideshow. Missing hero cats. Yeah, I didn't put hero cats on this because it was I made it before I knew about hero cats. Yeah. Well, next time uh, I'd add it because I'm getting them to to use them. So. Yeah. Next one is an even more expensive doctrine than the fox cats, the slow cats. Uh, slow cats core DPS ship is an archon with sentry drones. The logistics for this fleet is also the archon. They are remote rep archons with sentries, not triage archons. Unless you also include triage with this. Nah, no. Yeah, no need. Uh, uh, and then, uh, sorry, I'm last sorry. thing. Tackle for this fleet would be interdictors, because slow cats are a nullsec doctrine. What were you going to say, cold cuts? Oh, yeah, uh, did that, they made a change uh, with, like, limited the number of, uh, what drones, like, could be assigned to? Yeah, triggers. That's right, that's yeah, right. they just made it so that um, you can only assign 50 drones to a single person. That that doesn't really affect this fleet. It just means that more people need to pay attention during slow cats. Oh, yeah, you can get multiple. Okay, I see. Yeah, and you, just, you just need more triggers, that's all. Yeah, you just assign it to your squad leader, and then your squad leader takes care of it. Yeah. Uh, here, I'll link, uh, I'll link one in... Uh... Lecture. That's my slow cat. You notice that it says truncated because there are a lot of drones in the drone bay. Archons have a huge drone bay, comparatively. These will be used... Uh, exclusively in NullSec alliances. Fights on uh, station timers, IHUB timers, etc. Assuming the other fleet doesn't drop supers and titans. Next doctrine is one that you're probably already familiar with. It's called Treble Cats. The core DPS ship for this is the Heavy Missile Launcher Fit Caracal. Uh, logistics are Scythes. Anti-Tackle and E-War are Bellicose and Celestis. And Tackle Frigates, you'll use Interceptors or Tech 1 Frigates in low sec. Null sec, you'll probably use uh, Interdictors. Or you'll... 
or you'll be attacking a fleet that has a reason to stay on grid. Treble Cats is a much cheaper doctrine than we've seen so far. The Treble Cat Caracal itself is worth maybe 40 million. After Burning Cruiser uh, can go up to seven, 800 meters per second with a range of, I think, 70 kilometers with next skills, maybe more. And this is an Alpha Fleet. Yeah, exactly what Sale just said. Uh, it's an alpha fleet. You have to have enough tre uh, treble cat caracals in fleet to literally remove the enemy target from the field in one shot. Maybe two or three. If it takes you more than three shots to kill something, they're going to catch reps, and you won't break the reps. Absolute minimum number of... Uh, caracals you want in this fleet is 25. Shanazera brings up the question, uh, why are these fleet compositions called doctrines? I will defer to Saber. He has more experience on this matter than I do. Um, you're asking why are they called doctrines? Yes, that was the question. It, it's military terminology. It comes from the military. in in all In all wars um, throughout history, forces have used doctrines. Um, that could be, you know, that could be the weapons they were using. Um, how you fight, um, psychological warfare versus conventional warfare. These are all doctrines, uh, and that, that's what the word doctrine means. I mean, yeah, it's also, doctrine can mean a religious doctrine, but it, it's also used in military terminology. So it's not an Eve thing, it's a military thing. Yes, the yeah, phalanx, yeah. that's a doctrine, yes. Yeah, Roman phalanx is a very good example. Uh, that's a style of fighting with specific weapons that is far superior to anything else that there was at the time. And uh, to answer the question that was asked right after that, is it an alpha fleet because the fire rate is relatively slow? And uh, not really. It's an alpha fleet because you're trying to kill something with a volley. It you has low DPS, but it has so much initial firepower. Yes, it has low sustained DPS, but it has very high volley damage. So usually that does mean a low rate of fire, but not necessarily. Here's a scaled down version of an alpha fleet. I'll just find it here. You run those together, just as you would caracals. Yeah, alpha fleets will usually be uh, the long range version of. Uh, of a weapon system. So, I keep forgetting which one's long range for lasers. Is it beam or pulse? Beam. beam. Okay, so beam lasers, railguns, artillery, and uh, heavy missiles, light missiles, cruise missiles, etc. Yeah, when you get up to the battleship levels, though, uh, Amar, you want tachyons over beams. What he said. I don't fly it's confusing. There's um, <laughs> there's there's mega beams to go with your mega pulse, right? Close and long range. But there's also a weapon set called tachyons, and those are your your long range volley damage.
I don't fly slave ships. <laughs> no You're missing out. out. <laughs> All right. Next doctrine is uh, actually not a PL doctrine, but somehow it got the name Dick Cats. You may be more familiar with it as Tweet Fleet. Uh, these are dual prop blaster thoraxes for the core DPS. Dual prop means they have both micro warp drive and an afterburner. Logi will be executors, Ewar will be Celestis, uh, and Tackle will be interceptors or Tech 1 frigates. This is just a brawling doctrine. Blasters have the shortest range in the game, so these are very, very in your face. I guess you could also use Slugfest, um, Boxing Match, I don't know. I still think your Mall Rats are better than your Dick Cats. Yeah, Dick Cats have higher DPS and lower tank than Mall Rats. Yeah. yeah. So if you really want a brick tanked, uh, doctrine, you will go with mall rats. Have faith for, in the MR. Yeah, for Tech 1 cruisers at least. Blaster Moas uh, will have a better tank than Blaster Thoraxes, um, but Moas will be shield tanked. Ew, tech one guns on that mall rat. <laughs> hey. Yeah, main reason I don't fly MR ships yet is because I don't have tech two lasers. So I'm just refusing to fly MR unless I have tech two lasers. Because I uh, scorch is yeah. good. Yeah. Yes, the mall rat that Zail Naklu just linked is the mall rat fit that we use. You'll note it has damage control, adaptive nanoplating, Tech 2 1600 millimeter plate, and a reactive armor hardener. In addition to the uh, per skill level bonus uh, that it has to armor resistances. This, the Mauler has an insane tank for the ship size and cost. Mm -hmm. It can't handle a volley from 13 tornadoes, though. Well, it's a Tech 1 cruiser. Yeah, just bad memories. <laughs> Last doctrine that I have prepared uh, in the slideshow is called Bubcats. This is also a PL doctrine, and it's the uh, Talwar doctrine. Core DPS's light missile launcher fit Talwars with bursts for logistics and vigils for EWAR with interceptors and Tech 1 frigates for tackle. Bub cats. Uh, what's the range on a bub cat? Is it 50, 60? Uh. <laughs> No, I, I think it's 68. It's a, well, the question is, on the Bubcat, do you put the um, do you put the, the rig for range on it or not? The targeting range. And the sensor booster or not? Yeah. Yeah. If you do, <laughs> you'll get 70 kilometers easily. If you don't put the rig and the um, um, sensor booster on it, the range on a Talwar is more like 50 kilometers. No, you put the, uh, yeah, you put the sensor booster and the, uh, the rig on. Yep, then, then you'll be projecting to 70 with yeah. max skills. 
So this I'd is... say a, a good thing is between 65 and 70, you keep the fleet. Yeah, that's a good idea. And yes, this is the doctrine that you were just using for the RVB war. Uh, this is the baby version of Treble Cats. Although I think Bubcats came first. So mm-hmm. Treble Cats are the big version of Bubcats. Sure. No, because no. the, the Trebles um, were created to replace or a cheaper version of the Thundercats, the Tangus. Ah. See, this is why Saber's here. He knows more about the history of the Doctrines than I do. Yeah, I actually have. So the Treble Cat was a cheaper version to replace what I'm just going to link in the lecture. Yes, Baltic. That is the CFC Doctrine, Zakar. The Baltic, I believe, is Rail Megathrons. Yeah. Adama just asked in Mumble if we can link uh, in Mumble as well. We're linking in-game fits. I'm not sure how we can translate that to Mumble. Adama, if we were in the other channel, you know what I'd be saying to you right now. <laughs> yeah, so Trouble Cats are a cheap version of Thundercats. Much cheaper at 40 million versus... What's the cheapest you've seen at Tengu go? Oh, I don't know, 800? Yeah, yeah. Every single one of these doctrines that I mentioned uh, were created for a reason. They were created to combat a specific uh, other fleet composition. Tactics. What he said. Um, there's no better way uh, to for you to really take a look. I know it's not in a slideshow, but I have it here, and I do want to touch on it because I have been pushing the uni to fly them. And that's the hero cat. Uh, let me just open up fleet up so I can uh, link all three of them. I'll link the Tempest for you. I already linked it. Too late. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second here, guys. Okay, doctrines. Hero cats. Okay, so the Tempest. I know I linked it, but I'm just going to link it again. There's the Tempest hero cat. The Hyperion Hero Cat. And, last but not least, the Raven Hero Cat. One of the, actually, I would say the only reason to ever PvP in a Raven would be in the Hero Cat fleet. Now, what these are designed to do, if you open up any of them, you'll notice that they're all shield tanked. They all are dual propped. They all have a a micro warp drive and a micro jump drive. These battleships are chosen for a reason because they have utility high slots and they're very high DPS. So in the utility highs, you're not sacrificing any guns to stick newts. And this is the important part here. These ships are designed to kill supers with subcaps. They're designed to go into the danger zone to catch a super and kill it in an ever-escalating fight. 
Now, we've been trying to do this. Um, if you've been paying attention to pings, we've been going, um, fleets that I've been starting and telling everyone to get stacked on. Uh, the uni between Chill Town, the LSC, the NSC, and actually some wormhole guys um, have ships there too. We have these battleships stationed in Stackmon. Um, reason being, uh, we have discovered quite a few dumb supers in Placid um, that we're really paying attention to. And in the event that we catch one, this is the fleet that's going in. Um, I know in the past, uh, people have been using this thing called Dragon Slayer Fleet, but that's just a kitchen sink. Um, if it were to ever come up against an escalating fight or any opposition whatsoever, the, the fleet crumbles because it, it's, it, it's a kitchen sink as a flexion said earlier. And actually, I think there's no cohesion between ships. These ones are all similar. They're all dual propped. They all have the utility high. They all have high DPS. They're all for mobility. They work. Uh, I mean, not much more about it. I mean, they do have other ships like the, the Scimitar. Scimitar goes with it. Um, and I guess the Scythe for people that can't fly Scimitars. But um, there's absolutely no, no substitution with these ships. If you try, if you start to change out modules or anything like that, you cripple what the FC could do with the fleet. Because he is banking on everybody being fit similarly. So when he thinks... The fleet can just kite out or MJD out and just turn around and keep on fighting. And you're not dual prompt or you don't have the skills for a micro jump drive. So you thought it was okay to come out with, you know, you know, just an MWD. You end up dying and enough of those losses cripples the fleet. You won't be able to kill the super. Anything anybody wants to add? I decided to go ahead and add Hero Cats to the slideshow right now. I don't know if you can see live updates, but it's slide number 17. If slide 17 is still Hero yeah, Cats, yeah. then you didn't see it. No, 17 Hero Cats. Note that uh, I'm not listing Tackle with this because it's a super hunting. Fleet, so yeah, it's yeah. Hector's, Hector's, and Ghost Riders. Yeah, but it's a very high level dog. I guess, I guess, I can have maybe interjectors for this. Ghost Riders are Hector's inside of carriers. It's a way of getting tackle on field without having to worry about warping and setting up your your, your you know your tackle and them getting seen and anything like that. You literally just need a covert ops with a Sino. You light the Sino, you jump the carrier in, you jet the Hector out of the hold, you board the Hector out of your carrier, you point the super, you'd lock your own carrier. Yeah, it changes your time from getting on field to point from uh, minutes as you go through several Stargates to seconds as you Sino in and point. Now, is Ghost Riders one word or two? Mm, one. You have mul multiple Ghost Riders going. Um, actually, not necessarily. If you're able to get your bot out, <laughs> you can come back to your carrier. Because you remember, <laughs> you're, you're not going in. You're not going in alone, right? And whoever you have tackled is not going to be worrying about your carrier. He's going to be worried about the other Hictors that are around him if he's just killed you, right? So you can warp your pod off and come back to your carrier and just start repping the Hictors. It's the same reason why you don't have a single point with interceptors when you're trying to kill something. Yeah. Always get secondary points. Always, 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 always. But the Hero Cat is a doctrine that the uni can apply. Um, 
you know, a lot of people underestimate the uni, and it's because you guys been running kitchen sinks far too long. The uni strength is in its ability and its numbers. You get people with the you get the right FC leading and knowing the strengths of the uni. You can put 150 hero cats on field, which is a threat to the big alliances. It's just all about putting you guys in proper ships. That's all it's about. I just want to underline the point that um, R. Keels just made about, he says, so scouting a fleet a few jumps out becomes imperative to have the right counter ready. Exactly. Yes. yes. Scouting. The most important thing is you must scout the enemy to know what they have. How can you form the doctrine to counter them if you don't know exactly what they have? And that can sometimes mean n not just scouting the, the, the fleet that's on your doorstep, but the fleet that's also sitting on their Titan maybe 10 jumps away. So, but yeah, intel and scouting, absolutely the key here. Yeah, we we really stress that in Chilltown. Um, it's one of the first things. Uh, one of the first things I say to everybody that comes into Chilltown is you have to have an out-of-corp alt. It doesn't take a lot to... You don't even have to train it. Literally create it, and you now you have an out-of-corp scout. Um, where was I going with that? I had another point. Oh, there, there's two different things that you can deal with. Um, as Fang was saying, you know, see an oncoming fleet, right? So you have out of corp, you know, eyes scouting a fleet. Okay, well, now they're in this, so I'm going to be in this. That's generally how it's done. However, you have the right setup. Um, usually, when they're already on your station, it's up. Like, I mean, people are panicking, scrambling for modules, doing all this kind of crap. Um, they can't... It, it's a rush job. Now, if everything's gelled perfectly and set up beforehand, like in, uh, in Korsiki, every single pilot has many, many Doctrine ships ready to go in the hangar, fit. So if anybody were to ever come up and sneak up on us where we're not paying attention, it doesn't matter if they're sitting off right outside of our station, ready to go, tactic, I need to run. So I'm going to ask the question that I hear the most in my fleets, since no one's asked the question. Oh, you guys all want me to fly ship X, but I love to fly ship Y, and I fitted it out so it has the same engagement range as your ships. <laughs> Please let me bring it. I would say... Remember, that. we're not in Chilltown. I didn't, I didn't swear. No, I said remember what channel I think there was a yet insinuation in there somewhere. The only so yeah, time, I'd, like the to only hear, time. I'd like to hear the answer. If we're flying a fleet doctrine, the only time I will allow something that is not explicitly in the doctrine is if it's a scout or tackle ship. Because... The only thing those uh, are needed for are getting a point. And why? What's the reason? Because it will not fit with the uh, with the rest of the fleet. Yeah, it might have the same engagement range. It might have the same tank type, but it won't have the maneuverability. It won't have uh, the amount of tank uh, needed. It might not have the lock range to deal with what you're doing. These ships are fit a specific way uh, for a reason. They're built to do a specific thing. And if you put the same modules on a different ship, you have different bonuses, you have different uh, resist profile. Uh, it's, it's just not the same ship. Arkeels asks, 
So to that point, every doctrine looks like it has a tech one tackle uh, and or interceptor. Is there a standard tackle fit for all doctrines? Um, I know for interceptors, uh, you need micro warp drive, medium shield extender, and long point at the bare minimum. Yeah, yeah. usually the interceptors fit don't change um, at all. Uh, that being said, you should have the right scepter fitted out properly. I mean, the raptor and the crow, you fit completely different. You don't make them similar. Uh, but those, you don't really have to change, and they're pretty much universally accepted into every doctrine. There's not much you need to do. Yeah, I would also point out that you don't bring a raptor as a fleet uh, interceptor for tackle. The raptor is a DPS interceptor. Yeah. Uh, fleet interceptor is the interceptor that has a bonus to point range. If so every race has two interceptors, and the fleet ones are the crow, the stiletto, the Ares, and the malediction. Malediction and crow being the better of the two, or of the four, sorry. Yeah, because they can apply DPS at their point range. FCs never say no to NTs, and I will attest to that. I have flown an NT more times than I can count in Snigwaf, and they have never said no to me. Unless we were flying uh, a Black Ops fleet, in which case I got into a bomber. Yeah, there's, I mean, I stress, one of the things I do stress a lot with Doctrines, um, we're very, I, I, we're not unforgiving, but we're not forgiving either when it comes to doctrines. If you can't fly the proper ships, you don't come. Like, I'm not going to bring stuff that it doesn't belong in the fleets. However, interceptors are universally accepted into everything. You don't have to worry about at all. They're just, you know, you can't fly that. You can fly a scepter. Bring it. You're more than welcome. Interceptors aren't only used for tackle. They're used for uh, warp out points, pings. Because they're so much faster than the rest of the fleet, they can burn 150 kilometers in front of the fleet so that the fleet can be ready to warp out. Just don't try to take on a dram mail by yourself. <laughs> fleet interceptors are not DPS interceptors. Uh, Fleet Up is, uh, there's a link to it in the Chilltown MOTD. It's the in-game channel Chill-Town. And it's basically where we put up our PvP fits. Um, we made the website because the UniWiki kind of made me have a stroke when I looked at it for PvP. And it's an unbelievable site. It, it, you can open it up in-game, buy the fits right out of the Fleet Up through the game because it all connects it's it's amazing fleet up why not battle uh, clinic because battle clinic is probably worse than the uniwiki yeah the reason the reason why not battle clinic shana is signal to noise ratio a lot of the fits are ancient and also they're public so everyone can see them yeah i mean you can you can look for a fit, for example, on Battle Clinic. I've done it many times. And then you realize that the fit that you're looking at is from 2009. So for starters, that's not going to be good. Secondly, Fleet Up. The, only a handful of people have contributed to the Fleet Up fits. It wasn't like we put Fleet Up up and said, hey, does anyone have an Ares fit? Throw it in. No, it was like Saber, me, Taka... You know, there were a handful of people that put those those fits there. So hopefully you can have a bit of assurance that there's some quality there. Yeah. All these PvP fits are designed by PvPers. It's not going to be... You know, does anybody have X fit and a PvE -er is giving you a PvP fit? But by all means, you know, do your research, look on Battle Clinic, look on Killboards... 
see what people are flying. Ask yourself the question, why is my fit like this when this guy's fit is like that? It's always useful to, to do that research and think about it. Oh, yeah. What, what am I, what am... Whenever I fly a new ship, I always look, that, look the ship up on the killboard, see what people are losing, see how they're fitting it. Yeah, they're, um, this could be for another a class for another time or a lecture or whatever, but one of the, one of the things that, uh, I enjoy doing and um, some of the few people have been starting to do, um, CJ, who's part of the NSC, um, said he had a, a Russian problem. You know, Russians were coming in. So, you know, I asked what, what were they flying? And he said, Helis. I said, do you have a death mail from them? He said, yes. He linked the mail. We plugged it into EFT. We went over it together. We found, we, we saw its capabilities and then we started to design something to counter it. And we figured out that the thing can engage without its drones over 50k. So right there, once you, you pick a doctrine that now exceeds 50k, bye bye drones. Well, there's the DPS. Now, do you want to be mobile? Well, yes, you do, because the Gila didn't have a cap booster. So now you can dictate range, and if it tries to keep up with you, it caps out. So now you have you a mobile greater than 50 doctrine. Um, and then it was, uh, oh, well, they run with logistics. Okay, well, now you need an alpha. Okay, so now you need alpha greater than 50 and mobile. And you have your ruptures, you have your trebles, you have your rail thoraxes. These are the doctrines that can fight them, and they can't do a damn thing. So by reverse engineering their kill mails and plugging it in and doing the research for yourself, you can understand their capabilities, and now you can build something to defeat it. Do we have any more questions about fleet doctrines? I'll stay here for uh, more Q&A, but I would like to stop the recording. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, thanks for coming to the class. Like I said, I'll still be here if you have any more questions that are not directly related to fleet doctrines. Thank you, Reflection.